Good morning, this is Pamela, and you're listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We are going to continue in our book reading, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinaquai, and we are on chapter 59. When it became evident in 1851 that my plan of forming a grand colony of Roman Catholic French-speaking people on the prairies of Illinois was to be a success, was that R.C. McGee, then editor of the Freeman's Journal, official journal of the Bishop of New York, wrote me to know my views and immediately determined to put himself at the head of a similar enterprise in behalf of the Irish Roman Catholics. He published several able articles to show that the Irish people, with very few exceptions, were demoralized, degraded, and kept poor around their groggeries and showed how they would thrive become respectable and rich if they could be included to exchange their grog chops for the fertile land of the West. Through his influence, a large assembly, principally composed of priests to which I was invited, met at Buffalo in the spring of 1852. But what was this his disappointment when he saw that the greater part of those priests were sent by the bishops of the United States to oppose and defeat his plans? He vainly spoke with a burning eloquence for his pet scheme. The majority coldly answered him, We are determined, like you, to take possession of the United States and rule them, but we cannot do that without acting secretly and with the utmost wisdom. If our plans are known, they will surely be defeated. What does a skillful general do when he wants to conquer a country? Does he scatter his soldiers over the farmlands and spend their energy and power in plowing the fields and sowing grain? No, he keeps them well united around his banners and marches at their head to the conquest of the strongholds, the rich, and the powerful cities. The farming countries then submit and become the price of his victory without moving a finger to subdue them. So it is with us, silently and patiently, we must mass our Roman Catholics in the great cities of the United States, remembering that the vote of a poor journeyman, though he be covered with rags, has as much weight in the scale of power as the millionaire Astor, and that if we have two votes against this one, he will become as powerless as an oyster. Let us then multiply our votes. Let us call our poor but faithful Irish Catholics from every corner of the world and gather them into the very hearts of those proud sidles which the Yankees are so rapidly building under the names of Washington, New York, Boston, Chicago, Buffalo, Albany, Troy, Cincinnati, etc., under the shadow of those great cities, the Americans consider themselves a giant and unconquerable race. They look upon the poor Irish Catholics with supreme contempt as only fit to dig the canals, sweep the streets, and work in their kitchens. Let no one awake those sleeping lions today. Let us pray, God, that they may sleep and dream their sweet dreams a few more years. How sad will their awakening be when, with our outnumbering votes, we will turn them forever from every position of honor, power, and profit. What will those hypocritical and godless sons and daughters of the fanatical pilgrim fathers say when not a single judge, not a single teacher, not a single policeman will be elected if he be not a devoted Irish Roman Catholic? What will those so-called giants think of their matchless shrewdness and ability when not a single senator or member of Congress will be chosen if he be not submitted to our Holy Father the Pope? What a sad figure those Protestant Yankees will cut when we will not only elect the president, but fill and command the armies, man the knaves, and hold the keys of the public treasury. It will then be for our faithful Irish people to give up their grog shops in order to become the judges and governors of the land. Then our poor and humble mechanics will leave their damp ditches and muddy streets to rule the cities and all their departments for the stately mansion of mayor to the more humble, though not less noble, position of teacher. Then, yes, then we will rule the United States and lay them at the feet of the vicar of Jesus Christ, that he may end may put an end to their godless system of education and pious laws of liberty of conscience, which are an insult to God and man. R.C. McGee was left almost alone when the votes were taken. From that, the Catholic priests, with the most admirable ability and success, have gathered their Irish legions into the great cities 
of the United States and the American people must be very blind indeed if they do not see that if they do nothing to prevent it, the day is very near when the Jesuits will rule their country from the magnificent White House at Washington to the humblest civil and the military department of this vast republic. They are already the masters of New York, Baltimore, Chicago, St. Paul, New Orleans, Mobile, Savannah, Cincinnati, Albany, Troy, Milwaukee, St. Louis, San Francisco, etc. Yes, San Francisco, the rich, the great queen of the Pacific, is in the hands of the Jesuits. From the very first days of the discovery of the gold mines of California, the Jesuits had the hopes of becoming masters of those inexhaustible treasures, and they secretly laid their plans to the most profound ability and success. They saw at once that the great majority of the lucky miners of every creed and nation were going back home as soon as they had enough to secure an honorable competence to their families. It became then evident and of those multitudes which the thirst of gold had brought from every corner of the world, not one out of fifty would fix their homes in San Francisco. The Jesuits saw at a glance that if they could persuade the Irish Catholics to settle and remain there, they would soon be the masters and rulers of that golden city, whose future is so bright and so great. And that scheme worked day and night with the utmost perseverance, has been crowned with perfect success. The consequence is that while you find only a few Americans, German, Scotch, and English millionaires in San Francisco, you will find more than 50 Catholic Irish millionaires in that city. It's a richest its richest bank, Nevada Bank, is in their hands, and so are all the street railways. The principal offices of the city are filled with Irish Roman Catholics. Almost all the police are composed of the same class, as well as the volunteer military associations. Their combat unity in the hands of the Jesuits with the enormous wealth make them also supreme masters of the mines of California and Nevada. When one knows the absolute abject submission of the Roman of the Irish Roman Catholics, rich or poor, to their priests, how the mind, the soul, the will, the conscience are firmly and irrevocably tied to the feet of their priests. He can easily understand that the Jesuits of the United States form one of the richest and most powerful corporations the world has ever seen. It is well known that those 50 Catholic millionaire, millionaires with their marads of employees are, through their wives and by themselves, continually at the feet of the Jesuits, who swim in a golden sea. No one, if he be not a Roman Catholic or one of those so-called Protestants who give their daughters to the nuns and their sons to the Jesuits to be educated, has much hope, where the Jesuits rule of having a lucrative office in the United States today. The Americans, with few exceptions, do not pay any attention to the dark cloud which is rising at their horizon from Rome. Though that cloud is filled with rivers of tears and blood, they let it grow and rise without even caring how they will escape the impending hurricane. It is to San Francisco that you must go to have an idea of the number of secret and powerful organizations with which the Church of Rome prepares herself for the impending conflict through which she hopes to destroy the schools and every vestige of human rights and liberty in the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. In order to be more easily Drill the Roman Catholics and prepare them for the irrepressible struggle. The Jesuits have organized them into a great number of secret societies, the principal of which are Ancient Order of Hiberians, Irish American Society, Knights of St. Patrick, St. Patrick's Cadets, St. Patrick Mutual Alliance, Apostles of Liberty, Benevolent Sons of the Emerald Island, Knights of St. Peter, Knights of the Red Brand, Knights of the Column Skill, the Sacred Heart, etc., etc., the Secret Heart. Almost all these secret associations are military ones. They have their headquarters at San Francisco, put their rank and file are scattered 
all over the United States. They number several hundred thousand soldiers who, under the name of the U.S. Volunteer Militia, are officered, are offered, officered by some of the most skillful generals and officers of this republic. Another fact to which the American Protestants do not sufficiently pay attention is that the Jesuits have been shrewd enough to have a vast majority of Roman Catholic generals and officers to command the army and man the navy of the United States. Rome is in constant conspiracy against the rights and liberties of all men all over the world, but she is particularly so in the United States. Long before I was ordained a priest, I knew that my church was the most impressible enemy of this republic. My professors of philosophy, history, and theology had been unanimous in telling me that the principles and laws of the Church of Rome were absolutely antagonistic to the laws and principles which are the foundations of the Constitution of the United States. First, the most sacred principle of the United States Constitution is the equality of every citizen before the law. But the fundamental principle of the Church of Rome is the denial of that equality. Number two, the liberty of conscience is proclaimed by the United States, a most sacred principle which every citizen must uphold even at the price of his blood. But the liberty of conscience is declared by all the popes and councils of Rome, a most godless, unholy, and diabolical thing which every good Catholic must abhor and destroy at any cost. Third, the American Constitution assures the absolute independence of the civil from the ecclesiastical or church power, but the Church of Rome declares through all her pontiffs and council that such independence is impiety and a revolt against God. Fourth, the American Constitution leaves every man free to serve God according to the dictates of his conscience. But the Church of Rome declares that no man has ever had such a right, and that the Pope alone can know and say what man must believe and do. Five, the Constitution of the United States denies the right in any body to punish any other for diver from differing from him in religion. But the Church of Rome says that she has a right to punish with the confiscation of their goods or the penalty of death those who differ in faith from the Pope. Number six, the United States have established schools all over their immense territories where they invite the people to send their children that they may cultivate their intelligence and become good and useful citizens. But the Church of Rome has publicly cursed all those schools and forbidden their children to attend them under pain of excommunication in this world and damnation in the next. Number seven, the Constitution of the United States is based on the principle that the people are the primary source of a civil power. But hundreds of times the Church of Rome has proclaimed that this principle is impious and heretical. She says that all government must rest upon the foundation of the Catholic faith with the Pope alone as the legitimate and infallible source and interpreter of the law. I could cite many other things proving that the Church of Rome is an absolute and irreconcilable enemy of the United States, but it would be too long. These are, the, these are sufficient to show to the American people that Rome is a viper, which they feed and press upon their bosom. Sooner or later, that viper will bite to death and kill this republic. This was foretold by Lafayette and is now promulgated by the greatest thinkers of our time. The greatest inventor, or rather the immortal father of electric telegraphy, Samuel Morris, found it out when in Rome and published it in 1834 in his remarkable work, Conspiracies Against the Liberties of the United States. The learned Dr. S. Iranius Prime in his life of Professor Morris says, When Mr. Morris was in Italy, he became acquainted with several ecclesiastics of the Church of Rome and was led to believe from what he learned from them that a political conspiracy under the cloak of a religious mission was formed against the United States when he came to Paris and enjoyed the confidence and friendship of Lafayette. He stated his convictions to the general who fully concurred with him in the reality of such a conspiracy. 
at Great Statesman and Patriot, the late Richard W. Thompson, Secretary of the Navy, in his admirable work, The Papacy and the Civil Power, says, Nothing is plainer than that if the principles of the Church of Rome prevail here, our Constitution would necessarily fall. The two cannot exist together. They are an open and direct antagonism with the fundamental theory of our government and of all popular government everywhere. The eloquent speech orator Casteller, speaking of his own Church of Rome, said in 1869, There is not a single progressive principle that has not been cursed by the Catholic Church. This is true of England and Germany, as well as all Catholic countries. The Church cursed the French Revolution, the Belgian Constitution, and the Italian Independence. Not a constitution has been born, not a step of progress made, not a solitary reform effected, which has not been under the terrific anamathas of the church. But why ask the testimony of Protestants or liberals to warn the American people against that conspiracy when we have the public testimony of all the bishops and priests to prove it? With the most daring impudence, the Church of Rome, through her leading men, is boasting of her stern determination to destroy all the rights and privileges which have cost so much blood to this American people. Let the Americans who have eyes to see and intelligence to understand read the following unimpeachable document and judge for themselves of what will become of this country if Rome is allowed to grow strong enough to execute her threat. The church is of necessity intolerant. Heresy she endures when and where she must, but she hates it and directs all her energies to destroy it. If Catholics ever gain a sufficient numerical majority in this country, religious freedom is at an end, so our enemies say, so we believe. No man has a right to choose his religion. Catholicism is the most intolerant of creeds. It is intolerance itself. We might as rationally maintain that two and two does not make four as the theory of religious liberty. Its impiety is not only equaled, it is absurdity. The church is instituted as every Catholic who understands his religion believes to guard and defend the right of God against any and every enemy at all times, in all places. She therefore does not and cannot accept or in any degree favor liberty in Protestant sense of liberty. The church, the Catholic church, is the medium and channel through which the will of God is expressed. While the state has rights, she has them only in virtue and by permission of the superior authority, and that authority can be expressed only through the church. Protestantism has not and never can have any right where Catholicity has triumphed. Therefore, we lose the breath we expend in declaiming against bigotry and intolerance and in favor of religious liberty or the right of any man to be of any religion as best he pleases him. That best pleases him. Religious liberty is merely endured until the opposite can be carried into effect without peril to the Catholic Church. Reverend O'Connor, Bishop of Pittsburgh. The Catholic Church numbers one-third the American population, and if its membership shall increase for the next 30 years, it has the 30 years past. In 1900, Rome will have a majority and be bound to take this country and keep it. There is, ere long, to be a state religion in this country, and that state religion is to be the Roman Catholic. 1. The Roman Catholic is to wield his vote for the purpose of securing Catholic ascendancy in this country. 2. All legislation must be governed by the will of God, unerringly indicted, indicated by the Pope. 3. Education must be controlled by Catholic authorities and under education, the opinions of the individual and the utterances of the press are included, and many opinions are to be forbidden by the secular arm under the authority of the church, even to war and bloodshed. It was pur proposed that all religious persuasions should be free and their worship publicly exercised, but we have rejected this article as contrary to the canons and councils of the Catholic Church. Everyone knows that one of the first and most solemn acts of the present Pope, Leo VIII, 
was to order that the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas should be taught in all the colleges, seminaries, and universities of the Church of Rome throughout the whole world as the most accurate teaching of the doctrines of his church. Well, on the 30th of December, 1880, I forced the Reverend Foley, Bishop of Chicago, to translate from Latin into English before the court of Kankakee and to swear that the following law was among those promulgated by St. Thomas as one of the present and unchangeable laws of the Church of Rome. Though heretics must not be tolerated because they deserve it, we must bear with them till by a second admonition they may be brought back to the faith of the Church. But those who, after a second admonition, remain obstinate in their errors must not only be excommunicated, but they must be delivered to the secular power to be exterminated. After the bishop had sworn that this was the true doctrine of the Church of Rome expressed by St. Thomas and taught in all the colleges, seminaries, and universities of the Church of Rome, I forced him to declare under oath that he and every priest of Rome, once a year, under pain of external damnation, is obliged to say, in the presence of God, in his brevivarium, his official prayer book, that the doctrine was so good and holy that every word of it has been inspired by the Holy Ghost to St. Thomas. The same Bishop Foley was again forced by me before the same court of Kentucky to translate from Latin into English the following decree of the Council of Latrine and to acknowledge under oath that it was as much the law of the Church of Rome today as on the day it was passed in the year 1215. We excommunicate and anathemize Every heresy that exalts itself against the holy orthodox and Catholic faith, condemning all heretics by whatever name they may be known. For though their faces differ, they are tied together by their tails. Such as are condemned are to be delivered over to the existing secular powers to receive due punishment. If laymen, their goods must be confiscated. If priests, they shall be degraded from their respective orders and their property applied to the church in which they officiated. Secular powers of all ranks and decrees are to be warned, induced, and if necessary, compelled by ecclesiastical censure to swear that they will exert themselves to the utmost and the defense of the faith and exasperate all heretics denounced by the church who shall be found in their territories. And whenever any person shall assume government, whether it be spiritual or temporal, he shall be bound to abide by this decree. Wow, decree. If any temporal lord, after having been admonished and required by the church, shall neglect to clear his territory of heretical depravity, the metropolitan and bishop of the providence shall unite in excommunicating him. Should he remain contempt con Meshias, a whole year, the fact shall be signified to the supreme pontiff, who would declare his vassals released from their allegiance from that time, and will bestow his territory on Catholics to be occupied by them on condition of exterminating the heretics and preserving the said territory in the faith. The Catholics who shall assume the cross for the extermination of heretics shall enjoy the same indulgence and be protected by the same privileges as are granted to those who go to the help of the Holy Land. We decree further that all those who have dealings with heretics, especially such as receive, defend, and encourage them, shall be excommunicated. He shall not be eligible to any public officer. He shall not be admitted as a witness. He shall neither have the power to bequeath his property by will, nor succeed to an inheritance. He shall not bring any action against any person by any one can bring action but any one can bring action against him. Should he be a judge, his decision shall have no force, nor shall any cause be brought before him. Should he be a lawyer, no instruments made by him shall be held valid, but shall be condemned with their authors. 
Cardinal Manning, speaking in the name of the Pope, said, I acknowledge no civil power. I am the subject of no prince, and I claim more than this. I claim to be the supreme judge and director of the conscience of men, of the peasants that till the field, and of the prince that sits upon the throne, of the household that lives in the shade of privacy, and the legislator that makes laws for kingdoms. I am sole, last, supreme judge of what is right and wrong. Moreover, we declare, affirm, and define, and pronounce it to be necessary to salvation to every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. Undoubtedly, it is the intention of the Pope to possess this country in this intention in this intention he is aided by the Jesuits and all the Catholic prelates and priests. For our own part, we take this opportunity to express our hearty delight at the suppression of the Protestant chapel in Rome. This may be thought intolerant, but when we ask we profess to be tolerant of Protestantism or to favor the question that Protestantism ought to be tolerated. On the contrary, we hate Protestantism. We detest it with our whole heart and soul, and we pray our aversion for it may never decrease. No good government can exist without religion, and there can be no religion without an inquisition, which is wisely designed for the promotion and protection of the true faith. The Pope has the right to pronounce sentence of disposition against any sovereign when required by the good of the spiritual order. The power of the church exercised over sovereigns in the Middle Ages was not an usurpation, was not derived from the concessions of princes or the consent of the people, but was and is held by divine right, and whoso resists it rebels against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The Council of Constantine, held in 1414, declared that any person who has promised security to heretics shall not be obliged to keep his promise, but whatever he may be in engaged. It is, in consequence, that principle that no faith must be kept with heretics, that John Huss was publicly burned on the scaffold, 6th July 1415 in the city of Constance, though he had a safe passport from the emperor. Negroes have no right what the white man is bound to respect. If the liberties of the American people are ever destroyed, they will fall by the hands of the Catholic clergy. Lafayette. If your son or daughter is attending a state school, you are violating your duty as a Catholic parent and conducing to the everlasting anguish and despair of your child. Take him away. Take him away if you do not wish your deathbed to be tormented with the specter of a soul which God has given you as a secret trust surrendered to the great enemy of mankind. Take him away rather than incur the wrath of God and lose and the loss of his soul. All the echoes of the United States are still repeating the same denunciations against our public schools made by Major Capel, a prelate attached to the household of the Pope. That Roman Catholic dignitary has not only passed again the sentence of death against the schools of the United States, but he has warned the Americans that the time is not far away when the Roman Catholics at the order of the Pope will refuse to pay their school tax and will send bullets to the breast of the government agents rather than pay it. The order can come any day from Rome, said the prelate. It can, it will come as quickly as the click of the trigger and it will be obeyed, of course, as coming from God Almighty himself. The Catholic Columbian edit under the immediate supervision of the right Roman Bishop of Columbus, Ohio, says, Secular government schools are unfit for Catholic children. Catholic parents cannot be allowed the sacraments who choose to send their children to them when they could choose, make use of the Catholic schools. The absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in the defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential error, a pest of all others to be dreaded in the state. You should do all in your power to carry out the intentions of His Holiness the Pope, where you have the electoral franchise. Give your votes to none but those who assist you in a so holy struggle. Catholic votes should be cast solidly for the democracy at the next election. It is the only possible hope to break down the school system. It is of faith that the Pope has the right of deposing heretical and rebel 
kings. Monarchs so disposed by the Pope are converted into notorious tyrants and may be killed by the first who can reach them. If the public cause cannot meet with its defense and the death of a tyrant, it is lawful for the first to arise to assassinate him. See, sir, from this chamber, I govern not only to Paris, but to China, not only to China, but to all the world, without anyone knowing how I do it. A man who has been excommunicated by the Pope may be killed anywhere, as Escobar and Dukes taught, because the Pope has an indirect jurisdiction over the whole world, even in temporal things, as all the Catholics maintain, and as Serez proves against the kings, the king of England. The Roman Catholic historian of the Jesuits, Cretanu Jolie, in his volume 2, page 435, approvingly says, Father Givard, writing about Henry IV, King of France, says, If he cannot be disposed, let us make war, and if we cannot make war, let him be killed. The great Roman Catholic theologian Dins puts to himself the question, Are heretics justly punished with death? He answers, St. Thomas says yes. 2.2 question. 11. Art 3. Because forgers of money or other distributors of the state are justly punished with death, therefore all heretics who are forgers of faith and, as experience testifies, grievously disturb the state. This is confirmed because God in the Old Testament ordered the false prophets to be slain. And in Deuteronomy, it is decreed that if anyone will act proudly and will not obey the commands of the priest, let him be put to death. The same is proved from the condemnation of the 14th article of John Huss in the Council of Constance. That we may in all things attain the truth, that we may not err in anything. We ought ever to hold as a fixed principle that what I see white, I believe to be black if the superior authorities of the church define it to be so as for the holy obedience this virtue must be perfect in every point in execution in will in intelligence doing which is enjoined with all celerity spiritual joy and perseverance persuading others that everything is just suppressing every repugnant thought and judgment of one's own in a certain obedience should be moved and directed under divine providence by his superior just as if he were a corpse wow. which allows itself to be moved and led in every direction if the holy church so requires let us sacrifice our own opinions our knowledge our intelligence the splendid dreams of our imaginations and the sublime attainments of human understanding no more cunning plot has ever devised against the intelligence, the freedom, and happiness, and virtue of mankind under Romanism. The principal and most efficacious means of practical obedience due to superior and of rendering it meterous before God is to consider that in obeying them we obey God himself, and that by despising their commands we despise the authority of the divine master. When thus a religious receive <clears throat> a precept from her prelate, superior, or confessor, she should immediately execute it, not only to please them, but principally to please God, whose will is known by their command. If then you receive a command from one who holds the place of God, you should observe it as if it came from God himself. It may be added that there is more certainty of doing the will of God by obedience to our superiors than by obedience to Jesus Christ, should he appear in person and give his command. Wow. St. Philip used to say that the religious shall be most certain of not having to render an account of the actions performed through obedience for these. The superiors only who command them shall be accountable. In the name and by the authority of Jesus Christ, the plenitude of which resides in his vicar, the Pope, we declare that the earth is not the center of the world and that it moves with a diurnal motion is absurd, philosophy false, and erroneous in faith. In consequence of that infallible decree of the infallible Pope, Galileo, in order to escape death, was obliged to fall on his knees and perjure himself by signing the following declaration on the 22nd of June, 1663. I abjure, curse, and detest the error and heresy of the motion of the earth around the sun. Are you serious? 
In obedience to that decree, the two learned Jesuit astronomers, Lesur and Jacur, and Rome only a few years later made the following declaration. Newton assumes in his third book the hypothesis of the earth moving around the sun. The proposition of that author could not be explained except through the hypothesis we have, therefore, forced to act a character not our own, but we declare our entire submission to the decrees of the Supreme Pontiff of Rome against the motion of the earth. What on earth? I never knew this. A Catholic should never attach himself to any political party composed of heretics. No one who is truly at heart a thorough and complete Catholic can give his entire adhesion to a Protestant leader, for in doing so he divides his allegiance which he owns entirely to the church. Would he, the priest, be warranted in withholding any sacrament of the church from a man by reason of his preferring one candidate to another? Absolutely speaking, he would, because a priest is not only warranted, but bound to withhold the sacraments from a man who is disposed to commit a mortal sin. Our business is contrived. First, the Catholics be imbued with hatred for the heretics, whoever they may be, and that this hatred shall constantly increase and bind them closely to each other. Second, that it be nevertheless disassembled, so as not to transpire until the day when it shall be appointed to break forth. Third, that this secret hate be combined with great activity in endeavoring to detach the faithful from every government inimical to us and employ them when they shall form a detached body to strike deadly blows at heresy. Henry the Fourth. King of France, after being wounded by an assassin sent by the Jesuits, said, I am compelled to do one of, the, one of these two things, either recall the Jesuits, free them from the infamy and disgrace with which they are covered, or to expel them in a more absolute manner and prevent them from approaching either my person or my kingdom. But then we will drive them to despair into the resolution of attempting my life again, which would render it so miserable to me being always under the apprehension of being murdered or poisoned. For those people who have correspondence everywhere and are so very skillful in disposing the minds of men to whatever they wish, that I think it would be better that I should be already dead. Let us bring all our skill to bear upon this part of our plan. Our chief concern must be to mold the people to our purposes, Doubtless, the first generation will not be wholly ours, but the second will nearly belong to us, and the third entirely. The state is, therefore, only an inferior court bound to receive the law from the superior court, the church, and liable to have its decrees reversed on appeal. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery, and the aim of this organization is power, power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the violation of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms, and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master sovereign over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters, cost what it may. The society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, it is a meritorious work if committed by the interest of the society of Jesuits or by the order of its general. In the alcocation of September 1851, Pope Pius IX said, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, the ninth, said that he had taken the principle for basis that the Catholic religion with it, all its votes ought to be exclusively dominant in such sort that every other worship shall be banished and interdicted. If you ask if the Pope were Lord of this land and you were in a minority, what would you do? what would he do to you? That we say would entirely depend on circumstances. If it would benefit the cause of Catholicism, he would tolerate you. 
If expedient, he would imprison you, banish you, probably might even hang you. But be assured of one thing, he would never tolerate you for the sake of your glorious principles of civil and religious liberty. Lord Acton, one of the Roman Catholic peers of England, reproaching her bloody and antisocial laws to his own church, wrote, Pope Gregory VII decided it was no murder to kill excommunicated persons. This rule was incorporated in the canon law. During the revision of the code, which took place in the 16th century and which produced a whole volume of corrections, the passage was allowed to stand. It appears in every reprint of the Corpus Juris. It has been for 700 years and continues to be part of the ecclesiastical law. Far from being a dead letter, it obtained a new application in the days of the Inquisition. And one of the later popes has declared that the murder of a Protestant is so good a deed that it atones and more than atones for the murder of a Catholic. In the last council of the Vatican has the Church of Rome expressed any regret for having promulgated and executed such bloody laws? No. On the contrary, she has anamanathesized all those who think or say that she was wrong when she deluged the world with the blood of the millions she ordered to be slaughtered to quench her thirst for blood. She positively said that she had the right to punish those heretics by tortures and death. Those bloody and antisocial laws were written on the banners of the Roman Catholics when slaughtering 100,000 Waldenese in the mountains of Piedmont and more than 50,000 defenseless men, women, and children in the cities of Beezers. It is under the inspiration of those diabolical laws of Rome that 75,000 Protestants were massacred the night and following week of St. Bartholomew. It was to obey those bloody laws that Louis... The 14th revoked the Edict of Nantes, caused the death of a half a million of men, women, and children who perished in all the highways of France and caused twice that number to die in the land of exile where they had found a refuge. Those antisocial laws today are written on her banners with the blood of 10 millions of martyrs. It is under those bloody banners that 6,000 Roman Catholic priests, Jesuits, and bishops in the United States are marching to the conquest of this republic, backed by their seven millions of blind and obedient slaves. Those laws, which are still the ruling laws of Rome, were the main cause of the last rebellion of the southern state. Yes, without Romanism, the last awful civil war would have been impossible. Jeff Davies would never have dared to attack the North had he not had assurance from the Pope that the Jesuits, the bishops, the priests, and the whole people of the Church of Rome, under the name and mask of democracy, would help him. These diabolical and antisocial laws of Rome caused a Roman Catholic, Beauregard, to be the man chosen to fire the first gun at Fort Sumner against the flag of liberty on the 12th of April, 18. 1961. Those anti-Christian and anti-social laws caused the Pope of Rome to be the only crown prince in the whole world so depraved as to publicly shake hands with Jeff Davis and proclaim him president of a legitimate government. These are the laws which led the assassinations of Abraham Lincoln. No, I'm sorry. These are the laws which led the assassins of Abraham Lincoln to the house of rabid Roman Catholic woman Mary Surratt, who, which was not only the rendezvous of the priests of Washington, but the very dwelling house of some of them. That woman, gifted by God to be an angel of peace and mercy on earth, was changed by those laws into a bloodthirsty tigress. She had smelt the blood which everywhere comes from the robe, the hands, and the lips of the priests of Rome. Those bloody and infernal laws of Rome nerved the arm of the Roman Catholic Booth when he slaughtered one of the noblest men God has ever given to the world. Those bloody and antisocial laws of Rome, after having covered Europe with ruins, tears, and blood for ten centuries, have crossed the oceans to continue the work of slavery and desolation, blood and tears, ignorance and demoralization on this continent. Under the mask and name of democracy, they have raised the standard of rebellion of the South against the North and caused more than half a million of the most heroic sons of America to fall on the fields of carnage. In a 
very near future, if God does not miraculously prevent it, those laws of dark deeds and blood will cause the prosperity, the rights, the education, the liberties of this true, confident nation to be married, buried under a mountain of smoking and bloody ruins. On top of that mountain, Rome will raise her throne and plant her victorious banners. Then she will sing her te dooms and shout her shouts of joy as she did when she heard the lamentations and cries of the desolation of the millions of martyrs burning and the 5,000 auto de foe as she raised in all the capitals, the great cities of Europe. Wow, wow, wow. People, do you understand what I just read in chapter 59? Wow. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to give you wisdom. But I want you to understand what or who we have in the White House today. Not only do we have an Irish Roman Catholic in the White House today, but he is also a Jesuit. Not only does the Roman Catholic Church have a Jesuit Pope. You see what is going on in this world. We have been so filled with lies and false doctrines and all of this stuff that we cannot see the trees for the forests, brothers and sisters. It's right there. It is happening. We are in the last days. That first beast that rises up is a kingdom. According to the book of Daniel, kingdoms, rep the, the animals, the beasts represent kingdoms. And we are constantly calling the one the false prophet, which he is a false prophet, but he is going to be the ruler, the leader of the world. And he is going to go under the mask of Christianity, but he is going to be the dragon. This is happening, brothers and sisters. Get ready. Don't even get ready. Be ready and stay ready at all costs. Get yourself under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and stand in faith with nothing wavering. Do not fear nothing but God and God alone. Serve him with fear and trembling, but do not fear the enemy because the enemy is not greater than our God, the creator of all. I don't want to get too passionate on you guys. I, I don't, I, but, and I just want you to understand, go to the father, go to the father, ask him for wisdom, seek his face, seek him, get one, get one on one with him, become aligned with the word wavering no way no way shape or form know who you serve no know him know him know him that's so important know him go to the father become one with christ so when you go to the father boldly before the throne of grace you're going in christ jesus and he tunes his ear into those cries because you go in his son the lord jesus christ of nazareth Oh, brothers and sisters, I love you all so very much. Keep your eyes on Jesus, your nose in the book, which is the word of God, and embed the word of God upon the tablets of your hearts so you will not sin against God or be deceived. Until next time, I'm going to close it out, and we will pick up in chapter 60. I love you all so very much. Bye-bye.